All right, everybody, welcome to Brighter. So in today's episode, we're going to ask the question, what are all the different business principles that Elon Musk has implemented, the way that he runs businesses that allows him to be so, so successful? We're going to ask the question as well, is he now a risk or is he a promise for the stock? And finally, we also want to know, is it time? And what would happen if we did replace Elon Musk with a Tim Cook kind of operational person? What would happen to the company? So today we've got Larry Goldberg with us. He is a serial entrepreneur. So he's founded and been CEO of multiple successful companies. He's a longtime investor in Tesla. He's been following it closely. And he's also created a number of business cases for Tesla. So he's the person I wanted to ask these questions. Thank you, Larry. I appreciate you. Where are you at now? You look like you're in a car. Where in the world are you? Where in the world? I'm in, let's see, Hayes, Kansas. Okay. And then you were telling me you just visited Nevada. So tell us a bit, little bit about your trip. Where did you come from? And where did you go? And why did you do your trip? Well, the trip, um, I really went out to see the um, All-In Summit, to, to attend the All-In Summit, which was a fantastic uh, um, conference. But decided to do it by car, by Tesla, using my trusty Model X. Um, I drove all the way to California, and and now I'm driving back. Now on the way to California, I stopped, of course, in all. I stopped at the uh, lithium refinery. I stopped at Boca Chica. I then proceeded uh, to. Uh, Los Angeles to attend the summit, and then uh, visited the Fremont factory for a tour, and then Sparks, Nevada, to see the Giga factory there. I spent a little bit of time with my wife in Lake Tahoe. We, we had a few days off. She joined me out there and then flew back, and then I'm driving all the way back now. That's, uh, that's the size of it. It's been... It's been yeah. several weeks. Okay, fantastic. So let's get to the meat of the particular topic we're covering today. So we know that Walter Isaacson, um, a well-known author, has written several books and biographies. I've read four of them. Um, and uh, Einstein and Steve Jobs, obviously good ones. And then he's just recently written a biography on Elon Musk. Many of our viewers have already seen this, have already talked to a lot of folks about this. But the three topics, I think, you have actually delved into yet, I want to ask you, right, is one is what are the business principles that Elon has done that has made his business successful? Two, is he actually a risk? I mean, we saw that he does demo mode. He has a lot of crisis attention that he likes to do. I want to ask you those questions. And then related to that is, is it time for him to get a COO? Is he really necessary for the growth of the stock as it goes forward? What's the risk, right? So which of those, um, let, let me just show a quick uh, kind of while we're talking here, what is the, um, what do you, what do you th which one of those do you think you want to cover first? Uh? Well, I want to first give Walter Isaacson a shout out. What a fantastic job he did of this book. I, some people have, you know, criticized one or two aspects of it, but I have to say it's a great read. It's, I would say, very thorough from a from a uh, human description perspective, it does not really deal in great detail with the business aspects. I, I think that he has steered clear of trying to analyze the business perspectives. He's definitely dealt in great detail with um, Elon's approach to business. But he's not dealt, you know, with the underlying business in any great detail. And in fact, in some respects, he's kind of glossed over some very critical moments in the business, uh, in the businesses uh, that Elon has been in. And uh, you know, he he dismisses, for example, the boring company out of hand. He, he gives it maybe five lines and then dismisses it as a failure. I think. There probably is more of a story behind that, and there's probably a lot more to the boring company than he uh, gives it credit for. So, but all in all, great book. Now, dealing with um, the three questions you raise, 
firstly, I, I don't have at hand the, uh, the, the sort of the recipe that Walter derives from Elon's approach to business. But it all boils down to first principles. It, it, it all boils down to you know, getting to first principles of the problem at hand, assessing you know the cost of the product you you're trying to develop based upon the actual material that goes into that the actual raw cost of that material, and and then determining from that you know, what the value is of what you're trying to create and then getting rid of everything that is unnecessary in that in that product. You know, the, I think the most profuse uh, word in that, yeah. in that is the word delete. 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 Uh, you know, Elon is focused on this notion of deleting from the product everything and and he says, you know, if you don't have to go back and add back at least mm -hmm. two out of ten things you've deleted, you haven't you you know you haven't deleted enough, because it's only when you actually discover you know that something is really missing that you realize you actually do need it. Now it's amazing, you know, the repetition. I, one of the things that strikes you about Elon when you go to the events and you listen to him is listen to his interviews is that he repeats himself so frequently and you know he he has kind of a standard mantra and he will repeat it again and again and again really i mean if you read the book you 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 hear that repetition again and again and again. He has such a simple approach to business, to, to, to building product, to developing product, building the product, and, 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 and delivering the product. And he breaks it down to this absolute raw simplicity, and he does it again and again and again. It's amazing. Just it is serious. very amazing. So I did I did take a look at uh, a perspective when I read the book in terms of the business principles that I'm learning from Elon Musk and how he's become successful. And so you've named all the big ones, but let's let's go through the list, right? So first, um, incredibly shocked or not shocked. I think that's the wrong word, but you know that the the idea that he's mission first. He he really was driven by mission. And it's not about making money. And uh, in fact, he expects to lose money, but he thinks that mission is worth it. That drives his, his you know, desire to work hard. That's what he tells his employees, why you need to work hard. It's not because we need to make more money. So everything is basically, that's the underlying theme, was everything is mission first. He was mission first for decades. Okay? When it comes to what you were saying about first principle, that's obviously his, also his underlying platform here. And uh, I just found it really interesting, some of the examples he gave. Like for a boring company, initially they need to drill a vertical uh, hole in order for it to get it started even to build the tunnel, lower it down. And he said, well, why can't it be just like a groundhog or they don't, they don't have, you know, they just, they just point their nose down and they start going downwards. Like that's how they did it. Uh, that's kind of brilliant stuff. And how we always question requirements always ask who and assigns a person's name to it, not a committee. Who created that requirement? Question it. Why do you still need the requirement today? Dig deep into finding out. Um, he learns by failing. So he's willing to try things and fail. Fail fast is kind of his approach, um, but it's better to make a decision and move fast, right? Um, cost savings. So relentless, relentless focus on cost savings. This is interesting from the richest man in the world. These are very profitable companies and yet relentless cost savings. And it's just a matter of delete, delete, delete. Like you said, it's just so critical because when you have cost savings, when you delete things, it's not just cost savings as the value prop. There's so many more. And then he's stubborn, but he's also very flexible. Um, I actually think what you just said about him repeating things is obviously... Like people go, is he the greatest community, a uh, great communicator? He's not because he's kind of, he hesitates, he stumbles. You know, 
he says ums, but actually he's the best because if you keep repeating something, you know, people need nine times to hear something before they understand it clearly. Um, and, and so those are like some of the things. He's very risk. He's, he takes a lot of risk and he doubles down. But those are things I don't know are actually good business practice or not. So all the things I just said, which one do you want to dive deep in? You know, that speech impediment you spoke about, uh, you know, the first time I heard him speak, I was appalled. Mm. This guy, this guy's himself. And, you know, I've now heard him speak many, many times, and I've heard him, I've heard him on interviews, I've heard, heard him in, uh, you know, investor calls. I, I just get the sense that his brain has got multiple, he's, pro, he's, he's multi-processing, and he's got so many threads running at the same time. His speech, you know, he just can't catch up with his mind, with his speech. I think I think that's the problem. I think he just you know he needs a he need, he needs more bandwidth in 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 terms of uh, communication. That's the sense I get. He seems to have, be, have multiple threads running at the same time, and he has a hard time, you know, focusing on you know the question at hand when he's got all these th threads running at the same time. You know, I think that the that the, the the most important, if not the key lesson, I guess most important is the key. The key lesson to be learned here is this notion of you know this delete, delete, delete. This this mm -hmm. idea you. You have to keep removing these requirements. And I think back in my career, mm. how frequently I fell into the trap, allowing, you know, the product that we built to become far too big, far too soon. And I, I would say that's probably one of the biggest uh, mistakes of the multiple businesses that I've had. As I look back and having read that book, it's it's just so clear to me now that you know that that was the key. Now, if you look at the products that he's built and you think about the complexity of them, you know Falcon Nine. You know when you when he took the leap from Falcon One to Falcon Nine, and here you know well, it doesn't spend too much. That, but of course, I know a lot more about that background than Walter actually goes into. But the leap from Falcon One to Falcon Nine was incredible. I mean, it, you know, it go from this tiny little rocket to this massive rocket, skip through Falcon Five, I guess it was, to Falcon mm -hmm. Nine. I mean, it was an incredible leap, and the leap incorporated the design of a uh, of a first stage that could be ultimately proved to be able to be um, uh, recovered. So, you know, when you think about building something as complex as that and then think about the extent to which he was able to reduce the first uh, version of Falcon 9 to the point that it, it was able to be, um, you know, I mean, it just it just boggles the mind, and, and and it was in just that four or five year gap. It, it just I, I, the level of drive that the man has is just staggering, just staggering. That that aspect of his of of his years of miracle and there were so many miraculous years and it wasn't just one e event it was so many in so many different businesses um and you think about how he managed to achieve that i think that's the piece that i missed from the book or, and that's the piece that we know from his life and it just 
to somebody who's tr- who's tried to create a business and has created a business, I know that at one point I did have two companies and was running two companies. I, I couldn't do it. Four companies, yeah. five companies, <laughs> and I think that's the same time. Yeah, yeah, that wonder. You know that he's able to maintain such a level of detail in so many companies in such complex products with multiple products in many of them that's the level that that's the piece i think that was missing for for me from the book because that's a level of you know Complexity. I just don't know how it's how it's possible to do, and yet he keeps this very simple mantra, and he keeps expressing it again and again and again. He thrives uh, in complexity. He needs complexity. But uh, the part that I'm struggling with to understand is uh, delete is clearly the right, you said the right the, the most important lesson here. But that may only apply to hardware because I'm a software guy. I've started three software companies. And they're, you know, software. And so here he's creating X and he's like the everything app. So he's not deleting, he's adding functionality. In fact, with the X app, you can now post job listings. It used to be a separate app just for jobs. Now it's like X can do it too. He's probably going to add dating there. And anyways, uh, you know, like, so. But but, mm but delete, delete, delete. You know, it doesn't mean that you can't add, 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 and he does. I see. But yeah. he always starts by deleting. He, 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 he starts by reducing to the minimum, and then he adds from there once he understands gotcha. what the next. That's the magic. I mean, you know, I build software products, and invariably, the software product I build is too large, too many features. Too much going on yeah. for the first, you know, for the minimum viable product, and and understanding just how minimal that has to be is so important. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Larry. That was good. We reviewed a number of um, the things that he has as skills that I'm learning from. Uh, let's go to the next topic here, which is, you know, is he a risk? We have learned from Walter Isaacson, and many of us have seen it in just his own behavior, that he, is, uh, he goes into what they call demon mode. He's crisis attention. He's looking for crisis. Uh, he can't settle down and just be happy with the, you know, the peace and laurels, the, the wins, wins that he's got. He's always looking for the next crisis. So is that the kind of leader? What is that going to do you know, to the stock um, a lot of institutional firms, they're very concerned about him as a risk, as a as a leader. He's not your standard leader. He, he just says what he wants to say. He gets himself into political issues. What's your thoughts on, is he a risk or is he a promise? Uh, what's your opinion on that? You know, I, I said, well, you mentioned that Walter said, you know, he creates crises. Actually, he he. He generates crises as a as a means to focus mm-hmm. an organization on a particular area. I mean, in some cases, he just generates it out of fresh air for no apparent reason, at least to no for no apparent reason, according to Walter. Clearly, his motivation is to focus his organization and um, he does this by generating these crises sometimes uh, the the point of them is not as clear to the audience or to his companies or to uh, outside investors as they as they are to him you know we have to look at his his successes and his enormous um, achievements and measure you know his methods against those so you know the the example often given is you know tim cook tim mm-hmm. cook took over an organization that was the 
the work of a genius. Steve Jobs was a genius. He created this organization. He saved the organization when the uh, you know conventional uh, CEO took over and and managed to destroy it. Uh, and he saved it and resurrected. You know, the turnaround was unbelievable. The question you ask, though, is the question that I've been that that has been asked of me in recent times: is is it time for a you know a Tim Cook to take over, say Tesla? And I'll give you the simple answer in my view, and it is no, and and the reason is that Tesla is a work in progress. It is really at the beginning of a very long journey. That journey, you know, is going to take it into multiple places, and clearly it's going to evolve very significantly from where it is. Now, can a Tim Cook evolve it? It's possible. I think it would probably uh, slow down the evolution. You only have to look at Apple to see the degree at which that evolution has slowed. I mean, the rate of new product from that company is, you know, one every three, four, five years. And each new product is so, is so, Tough to actually get out into the marketplace mm -hmm. when I think about, you know, the the evolution of product there is just, it's become very, very, you know, slow. I mean, that's all that there is to it. I, I don't think this would have happened uh, under Steve's leadership. Now, would it be bad for? Well, the stock would probably be okay. Uh, you know, they'd start advertising, they'll start buybacks, they'll they do all the conventional stuff, but new product, probably not. Would would we see FSD in our lifetimes? I don't know. I, th I think it may be abandoned. I think uh, a Tim Cook would just, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think he would be the end. Is it at the end state that, you know, it could be sold as a nice add-on at, you know, a couple of, maybe $100, $80, $100 a month, uh, a, nice, a nice option at about three or $4,000? That's the kind of stuff I think we'd be left with. And the company would be successful. The company would be successful. Would the stock price go up? Ultimately, it would go up at the same rate it will under uh, Elon, no. And would it become more stable under a new ownership and r rather than this, these huge uh, fluctuations? Yeah. But it's the story has not been written yet. The Tesla story has not been written yet. The SpaceX story has not been written yet. The Neuralink story has not been written yet. So, no. The time is not right for Elon to step back, step down. I think Elon has a lot of crises to generate. The more crises he generates, obviously, the better it's going to get. And my money's on on Elon Musk, not on Tesla Motors. It's on Elon Musk. So that's my view. And Walter's book didn't change my view one bit. In fact, it kind of focused my view. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'm a big Steve Jobs fan. And I but I think that Elon Musk is not only 10 times, maybe 20 times, maybe 100 times uh, better. But I noticed that there's three things that they really do similarly. So if one was delete, 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 that's Elon doing that. And Steve Jobs was very famously known to simplify to just four quadrants and focus on the things that matter and things that don't dent the universe, don't do it. Like, at one point, Apple was creating their own printer. He said, that's ridiculous. Let's not do that. Uh, but then they both have a relentless drive to achieve something very quickly. And so the people who work for them, they all talk about how they're demanded to work hard, work long, 
really focus 100% of their time on the business just like they do, Steve Jobs and Elon Musk do. So they ramp quickly. And then the third thing, though, is they are willing to do moonshots. So because you deleted a lot of you know, frivolous things, you can spend more time in moonshots. These kinds of things, I don't think that a manager like a Tim Cook would do. They would not, um, they might do the cost cutting. I think that certainly uh, Tim Cook does that, but I, I think like he's more of a, the kind of the business kind, like he'll cut the whole business rather than focusing on the details. I don't know about that part. Uh, he, you know, they're, at this point, they're so rich. They're just managers. They're, they're not likely to push really hard on ramping the a specific, you know, staying overnight, sleeping <laughs> uh, at the factories. And then, um, and then the moonshots, they're just not, they're just not made for moonshots and, you know, major risk taking. That's the big difference. So, yeah. yeah I mean, you, you have to look at Tim Cook's record with the, uh, with the car, the, the Apple car, and whatever was going to be an Apple car. I mean, you know, he didn't have a clear vision for that, what that product was going to be. Clearly, he didn't have a vision, or if he did have a vision, he certainly didn't see it through. This is not a Steve Jobs type of approach. This is a, you know, a very classic business approach. So Tim Cook has done a fantastic job. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm in awe of him. And, you know, hopefully when Elon does retire, he'll have a, a Tim Cook type of guy. But man, I think you know Tesla can 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 get such value out of having Elon's leadership for these coming years. I mean, I have to say that if you look at uh, uh, Elon's leadership of Twitter, it's amazing what he's product in such a little time. Now, yes, he's you know. He's really scared a lot of advertisers away, and they're not coming back by the droves, and they're not spending by the drove yet. I think that's going to come, and I think that's going to come in a very, very big way. I think Twitter's going to be amazingly successful. Look, I'm an investor in Twitter. I'm, you know, I'm a limited partner in um, in one of the um, one of the funds that invested in Twitter, and I'm. I'm very happy with my investment. Um, a lot of people laughed, a lot of people get, but you know, Twitter's going to be very successful. It's going to be very, very successful. But there, you know, Elon got Elon got involved in a most, you know, very strange way, and one has to. One has to question it, but there was the mission, and the mission drove it. And ultimately, you know, he once he had built that mission in his mind, that was it. You know, he was going to end up doing it. And he, the, it's a work in progress, but my word, the work is happening at a rate I, I never <laughs> yeah. believed possible. So Linda Yaccarino, the CEO of X, <clears throat> was actually just at a conference this weekend. Just a, The video is going to drop today. And she said that X is now going to be profitable by next year. Next year. They're on path. They've got back 90% of their advertisers. They basically all came back already. And so, you know, Elon comes in and it's just a complete mess. But he needs to break things back down to the simple thing, get rid of all the fluff, and it's a mess. Then he re survives. It can survive. And now he's able to build, but he needed to delete first <laughs> and then add to yeah, it. Yeah. So, you have, you have to ask yourself, what did those thousands of people, was it 6,000 or 8,000, some enormous number of 8, people, 8,000, yep. 8, what did they do on a day-to-day -day basis? It wasn't was product. It not, yeah. I it mean, was, it was it, but Parag, Parag yep. is a tech, was a technical guy. He came up, you know, he came up from the ranks as an engineer. Yeah, but you know how the the famous example is they could not even implement an edit function. And why couldn't, it's not because of a technical issue. That must have been a policy issue. And that must have been just a, you know, for certain reasons, they don't want to implement it for the, whatever reasons they had. Like maintaining the, they wanted to maintain the, the 
the the the, the, the what the what what the Twitter was originally many many years ago. They don't want to get rid of that, you know. So they keep it short form and don't let edits. Well, that's not a feature that's you know. But they position it as, and it's oh, it's very much more complicated than we realize. It's not. Walter Walter Isaacson writes that you know they ripped out this um, this uh, computer cent data center in, yeah. in California, kind of overnight and very you know and you know it seemed like a whim at the time and it and. Elon admitted later on that it was probably a mistake, but I have to say I didn't think it was a mistake when you dis when he discovered, as a result of ripping it out, things really bad things happened on Twitter. I even remember it happening, mm -hmm. but it wasn't from an end user point of view. It didn't feel that serious, but apparently bad things happened. Turned out there were thousands of hard coded references. Right. In the code of Twitter, two servers in that center. Now, absent them ripping it out, do you think they would have ever found that in the yeah, code? It's, it's, that's okay, right? it's, yeah. it's staggering. And 8,000 engineers doing that? I, you know, they weren't engineers. They were not engineers. They're employees. There's only very few engineers. This was the one of the big issues is that it was not engineer led. Um, so well, it was engineer led. Yeah. Parag was an engineer. Yeah, but you know, it, it wasn't focused on the product. It wasn't about features. It got to policies. It got to content moderation. It got to you know, um, that's what the employees were hired for. They weren't there to build. There was no features, as you know. There was very few features, one or two a year. <laughs> yeah, and many of the features, many of their best features, they actually retired before they actually got to be used. Yeah, they were. Anyway, so amazing. Elon, amazing. You know, we got to witness what happened with a company that he takes over, software company, and see how we take care of it. And right now, it's projected to be successful, just like we... But it's a shocker for us. We all thought it was going to die. But let's let's get back to Tesla because I have an observation that yeah. people seem it's pretty obvious, but people forget to talk about Tesla. Tesla is a multiple businesses, not one. Yes. So when you talk about the car business, you probably should and can at this point have a Tim Cook run the car business today. Okay. But when you talk about autonomy, when you talk about robots, when you talk about energy, when you talk about um, AI. And we can name another five. They're all startups. You cannot have a Tim Cook manage those. They're dead and they're going to just wither and die if you have a Tim Cook managing those businesses. They're startups. You need a person like an Elon, and there's no one better than Elon to make those businesses succeed. But if you talk about the car company, you could argue that you could probably get, you should, he should probably, he already has executives running the gigafactories. It's not. I mean, he dives in and he finds the problems and he fixes those and no one else can do that. But in terms of like launching the Gigafactory, making decisions and so forth, the other thing that he does that no one else can do, not even a Tim Cook, I think, is the relationships that he has with the world leaders. I mean, That's maybe amazing. Tim Cook has that, but as you know, he's going around every month, there's yet another new world leader and business leaders that just wants to partner with him and work with him, and he able he's able to negotiate and get, you know, these are things you cannot do except for Elon. Well, I will say that it's probable that senior business executives do from time to time meet with uh, country leaders, but they would not get the kind of publicity that uh, Elon gets when he does such a visit. So I think that that. You know, we have to temper our understanding of it. So what's interesting is that foreign leaders find it necessary <laughs> to publicize their meetings with Elon. I mean, he's clearly become, you know, a, a voice, and it's a very important voice. It sometimes bothers me, you know, the level of um, – the level of – I guess exposure because you know it can be dangerous in this world. It can be very dangerous. That was great. Um, all right, thank you so much, Larry. That was great. Um, you know, we covered some topics that 
you know, we, we, we needed to talk about, about uh, Walter Isaacson's book. These are great business principles. Um, the risk taking that he takes his demon mode that he goes through. But at the end of the day, he is a force and a force for good. And as an investor, I'm very, very happy to invest in him still. And like you were saying, it's best for him to continue working here. Um, tell me just like your closing remarks on this whole thing. Yeah, we need to remember that there's a human being behind that. You know, I just, I feel for him. <laughs> I think he lives a very, 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 very tough life in that head of his. So I really do feel for him, but I really admire and respect and I'm very grateful for him. So that's my takeaway. Agreed. And then we are very lucky that he's living in our lifetime. One of yes. probably the greatest business person, if not this century, maybe the world. And then we are getting to invest in this company. I so. want to say, I just want to add one thing. Yeah. People mature. He will mature. And I think of myself back at, you know, 20 years, 25 years ago. <laughs> okay. Um, I was a diff I was, I was pretty rough. And I think if him in 25 years' time, I wish I would have, I wish I could be alive to see that because it's going to be, it's going to be impressive. Very good. Yeah, he's always changing. Thank you so much, Larry. Folks, uh, we appreciate Larry joining us uh, every week. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Thanks. Hey there, thank you for joining me. If you can, please consider supporting this channel so I can keep it going. It's a lot of work arranging all these amazing interviews. One of the easiest ways is just to click that join button and become a member of the channel. Thank you very much. Let's get brighter.